Hi, Peter again, and I'm here with Brian Larkin, who is a actor, producer, director, I think even composer. Have I missed anything else out there, Brian? Uh, writer, caterer, <laughs> um, jack of all trades, master of some. <laughs> yeah. So Brian's got um, a number of films today here at the festival, uh, mainly the Dead End trilogy, mm -hmm. but also some other uh, some short films that you also made. Everything was fine, quarantine yeah. short, and also scene. Mm -hmm. So the Dead End trilogy, mm -hmm. um, what's it about, first of all? It's about a hitman who basically travels to Hong Kong, has a past history in Hong Kong, who returns to Hong Kong and is sort of confronted with the reason why he left in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, He's very much a kind of slightly s solemn, retrospective thinking man's hitman. Yeah. Who basically goes there to do one last job. Everybody has one last job to do. Yep. And finds himself uh, in deeper, darker waters than he originally planned. Mm -hmm. And then he has to sort of fight for his life and find new allies. Um, and then that's the first film. The second film basically takes place about six to eight months later where he teams up with someone who was originally his enemy and they basically are tasked with taking out the leading players in a human trafficking operation, mm -hmm. operating out of, um, of Asia um, through MI6. Mm -hmm. And it's really about their relationship, um, the humility and humanity of these characters. They're not out and out bad guys. They do, they are three dimensional characters. Shades of grey. Yeah, and I, these yeah. are the kind of waters that I like to sort of navigate in when I'm writing something or creating mm -hmm. something, is to take a genre, a typical action genre, and find ways to sort of infuse it with more three-dimensional characters, a human aspect, yeah. Um, and yeah, that's really it. Was that your main inspiration for writing it, or did you have like, ideas that you'd always sat on over the years, or that kind of well, thing? That's a good question. I think I've, I've always kind of, the way that I sort of found my way into action movies was purely by accident. And because I was a straight drama actor and also did comedy and okay. coming through drama school, so when I got the opportunity to do this action film, so to speak, it was it was an opportunity for me to try and find other ways to develop scripts and work on characters that were more three dimensional, that had a vulnerable side, not vulnerability in the sort of classic sense of just being afraid of things, but where they're up against. You do get to see the human weakness uh, and the things that have shaped them and doing bad things for good reasons mm. and trying to explore that as an actor and try yeah. to make it more interesting yeah. and relatable as well. Definitely an interesting part of the trilogy. So how long did it take you to write um, the, the scripts for Dead End Trilogy? Well it was very much, the first film was made as a kind of, um, because I found myself in Hong Kong working on another movie, I was there for quite a while. Mm -hmm. So on my down days I would, um, my co-star actor uh, Julian Gardner, we were working on this, this movie with, um, with Donnie Yen out there in Hong Kong and I'd never been to Hong Kong before, place on the bucket list, never managed to go, mm. got the job, went to Hong Kong and was fell in love with the place, yeah, the right. landscape, yeah. the atmosphere, the, it's like a walk-in film set, the grimy back streets, the beautiful vistas. Yeah. So I, 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 I was writing in my hotel room, or writing, on my, writing the script on my phone when I had a break. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I was there for three months and we shot for I think 10 days um, and the script was kind of written as it was shooting because I, I had a sense of, where I, had, I knew where I was going to go after Hong Kong, I was going to go back to London, mm -hmm. then I was going to go to Los Angeles for pilot season as an actor and then I would end up back in Hong Kong again so the film took you know, quite a long time to make because mm -hmm. it, was, it was just ge geographically that's where I was right. so I decided to write the scene, I'm going to LA, why not have a scene in LA? And to broaden the canvas, make it a bigger landscape. Yeah, you know, so you, yeah. you can with the role of that guy because he's a hitman. Right? He's a, so tra he's he's a traveling hitman. hitman perfect, you know, yeah. so, so that worked out well. Mm -hmm. um, but then the second film was a lot faster. I wrote the script in two days, uh, and then the third script, I, when Ross I asked Ross if he wanted to direct it, mm -hmm. I'd already had a draft written, and we just basically we refined it and made it a lot more linear. Then we had the cross-cutting aspect, mm -hmm. um, London, Scotland, you know. And do that whole thing. So that was maybe about oh, two weeks of writing on that script. I mean, they're very short films, the 20 to 25 mm -hmm. minutes. Yeah. So as soon as you have an idea for the vision, you put the characters in a, a different situation and then, you know, the writing's pretty easy, but pretty much straightforward. Yeah, so as you say, they are roughly sort of 20 to 25 minutes each, the three mm -hmm. of them. So it's a feature length in total. Um, were you always planning on doing them as shorts or did you ever think of doing it as a feature? Or was it just logistically, it worked out easier? Well, I think the, the first film, this is another good question, the way this 
trilogy has come about with being three like many episodes mm. was I never intended on making the this a, this a feature film. I was in Hong Kong. Yeah. I wanted to make something. Yeah. I, I had a drone. I had a DSLR. And I travel with those everywhere I go, so it was an opportunity to film something, make something, and I thought, well, if I'm going to make something, why not just, you know, take in a landscape, give myself an opportunity to sort of stretch my wings a little bit as an actor and do something a little bit more, you know, different. But it was really kind of, it became, after they made the first film, and it did very well, we won like 35, 30 awards or something at film festivals, and people really liked it. And we decided, well, let, let's make another one because I've got two weeks off. I love Hong Kong. I went back to Hong Kong and made another one. It wasn't until the end of the second one that I thought, if I, this does go further, I need to start thinking about a feature film structure. So it was very much as I was making them, I decided, like, let's expand this world because at the moment, I think it's about 72 minutes for the three films. Yeah. So we are going to shoot, I guess, a, a rounding up episode, okay. put them all together. Okay. And then obviously what will happen is things will get cut out, like we'll take out right. 10 minutes of dead sure. end one, mm-hmm. you know, get to the point quicker, mm-hmm. have the action, the rising action, the denouncement and all those things. So there's probably about 15 minutes that comes out and another half an hour will go in. Okay. And that will make it the feature film. And I do have a script, mm-hmm. um, we're just because of COVID and everything, just mm-hmm. now it's just, you know, it's not easy to be creative and fly all over the world maybe. So. Sure. So at the minute you're playing obviously at our festival, are you going to be touring the Trinity at other festivals before you like do this idea for the... It's a nice idea, you know, I think that well, film festivals are very much a kind of one film at a time. Mm. It's not very common to have a trilogy of short films screening at film festivals, you know, and because you need to watch the three of them together yeah. to get it, sure. you know, so I think more like webisodes or kind of thing okay. festivals would be more appropriate for that. Mm. But um, we still get asked to screen to Dead End 2. Dead End 1 and 2 could be watched standalone, mm. but when you watch the third one, you're like, why am I watching this? Well, who are these yeah. people? Why do I care? Sure. And the first one sets all that up. You know, The second one gets them into the action, and the third one kind of gets into the, the, the characters' lives a bit more. So there's a lot of um, fight scenes, uh, yes. hand-to-hand combat and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. On a technical sort of side of things, what do you need to make sure happens to sell uh, you know, a hand-to-hand combat scene technically? Technically, mm. it's where the camera is placed always. Right, okay. You can get away with so much just by the angle of the camera. Okay. Um, how, how the cameras are lined up, how the actors are lined up, how mm. you sell that. Mm. If you're going to, one of the hardest things to do is to try and do a wide shot of action right. and try so the actors don't actually ever physically hurt each other, yeah. although there is contact. Um, it's it's ultimate, ultimately to make sure that the other actors who are receiving the blows sell it well, mm, sure. because you can throw a very believable punch, yeah. and you know you have to make it look like it will take someone's head off, yeah. and the right angle or just a slight six inches to the left there, the way the camera catches it, could sell it so much better. Right. That's the kind of first thing you need to make sure it's in place. Mm-hmm. Obviously, that nobody gets hurt. Mm. Obviously, the area is clean, mm. and you rehearse it like a dance. You just do it as well and the other thing is as well it becomes easier if you just shoot it in blocks okay. like if there's a big move that sells an, an actor that has to fall shoot that 10 seconds mm. from all the angles you need to get right. then move on to the next so it's like a chapter move on and just keep shooting through mm. these are the kind of, sort of basic things that you need to keep in mind yeah so you mentioned like choreography and stuff do mm. you do your own do you have someone come in and work with you we and rehearse what how, how does it work well so you you basically some Carter Ferguson, who did some of the action for the first and some of the action for the second film, um, we, he kind of works with an actor's skill base. So if you've got a particular move or a way of a, a special kick or mm-hmm. whatever your experience is, let that be known so that you can go, right, I can do quite a good spin and back kick and my punches are quite good, but my air work isn't brilliant. Mm-hmm. He'll work with that. He won't take you too far out of your ability zone. So don't don't overstretch. Don't do you know? I can't do a backflip, but I can do you know, mm. you know, a kick in handstand or whatever it is. Just spinning round. Yeah. Um, and you can get away with so much as well, just with grappling and punching because okay. the camera moves that quick. This is not a martial arts film. It's, it has to be brutal and real. It has to look like a street fight. Yeah. yeah. Like two guys going at it. Yeah. So it's just a case of working with those skills, and if 
as an opportunity to just shoot it the right way, get it moving like a dance, don't get hurt, shoot it, then move on. Great stuff. Uh, do it. So you've got another show, uh, the, your lockdown kind of show. Yeah. Do you want to tell us about, a bit about that? Mm -hmm. Everything Was Fine uh, is a short film about an accountant who goes into quarantine in a foreign country and he's, he has to spend what he believes is eight days in quarantine. Yeah. And then after eight days, the government has changed the regulations and he has to spend another seven days in, in mm -hmm. quarantine with little contact with the outside world. And it's basically, um, I made the short while I was in quarantine in Amman, Jordan, uh, last August. Okay, yeah. And as I say, I take my yeah. camera with me everywhere yeah. I go. So yeah. it was just a case of trying to stay limber and creative. And there was an opportunity for me to make a film mm. about quarantine. Mm. And it, it's very much um, aligns with all the things that we're going through right now. Um, with isolation, with loss of identity, loss of purpose. Yeah losing your job, your family, being cut off from the real world, relying so much on um, you know, the internet and all these things and ways to communicate. And it's, um, it's basically in sort of like a journey into the self, into the mind and about what can go wrong and the questions that we ask ourselves when we're alone. Mm. So it's almost like a prison sentence mm. until this character is confronted with all the voices inside his head that make him believe that he's not been a loyal person, he's not been a good person in his life until it completely disassembles him and makes him into something else. Um, so he's visited by various voices and versions of himself yep. with all the voices in his head until he's sort of like a shell mm. um, as well, of a man. Did you find it, um, what's the right word, a therapeutic kind of, mm. yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah very okay. much. And that's kind of how I approach all the things that I make. I'm inspired or influenced by something that's very current or it's kind of shaping who I am and I'll make a film about it. Like the first feature that I made, I'd lost my father. I made a film about the grieving process. Um, again, in quarantine, making a film about, you know, quarantine process. And not that I've ever been a hit man and killed people. <laughs> I was going to say. Real <laughs> dis yeah. Disclaimer, never yeah, yeah, killed yeah, anyone yeah. who didn't deserve <laughs> it. Um, yeah, so it's, it was therapeutic. It was cathartic. Yeah, that's the other word I was going to use. Cathartically yeah. creative. Definitely, yeah. You know, it makes it less real. When you, when you can make a film about it that other people can relate to. Mm. And it's a great way of passing the time as well. Mm. You know, if, if you were a, a painter or you were a musician, you would take your guitar. Definitely, yeah. Or you would paint a canvas. Yeah. I just take a camera and I make a film about it. You know? And it also, it's a great warm up um, for, for doing the other project that I was over there for. Right, okay. Um, so, so, yeah. A lot of people use the time to you know, do creative things. One of the only good things you can say that came out of the last year and a half mm -hmm. really some people have made some really really great art and yeah. you know films and writing or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. It's a it's a great time to it has been a good time for that and you know um now that we hopefully slowly start to go back into real life mm -hmm. you know we can use that and propel ourselves forward. So you've been working in the industry for quite a while now, mm -hmm. almost two decades I believe. Mm -hmm. Who's the nicest person you've ever worked with? This guy right here, <laughs> this cameraman who Sam. won't stop moving around, man. <laughs> hey Sam, you're cool. Uh, just sit down, you're, 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 you're making me very distracted. Um, some of the nicest people, it's, I wouldn't, I've worked with some big names and I've worked with some, some just amazing actors who I've learned a lot from. Nice people. Uh, everyone's generally nice because it's a wonderful industry we're working in and they're making a lot of money doing it and I think we should be grateful but and they are grateful. Um, I've worked with some, Donnie Yen is fantastic to work with yeah. because he is, he's not just an actor, he's an action director, he's, mm -hmm. on, he's a director, he's a writer. He's, he was there at my ADR, if anyone doesn't know what ADR is, additional dialogue recording, when an actor has to revoice their voice due to noise on the set. Yeah. He was there in the booth with me, he just took the time out to come in and made sure that the recorders got everything he wanted. You know, and he took me for lunch after that. He didn't have to do that. Mm -hmm. um, Gerard Butler's obviously uh, someone that I greatly admire um, because we've worked together and you know, we've stayed in contact on and off for the past five years. Mm -hmm. He was very generous on set as well. Um, made sure that they got the best of me and gave me opportunities when, when it was just like, next. Mm -hmm. He was like, no, no, he's got more to do. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, the, you know, actors like that as well. Morgan Freeman as well, he was, he was a lot of fun. Um, who else? Uh, recently, I'm working with some. I can't tell you. <laughs> um, some of the cast from Fast Nine. Okay. Wow. Well, yeah. uh, 
I'm working with at the moment and incredible fun. Very generous, nice. a lot of fun. Um, but I've worked with actors who, you know, who's number one on the call sheet and who's probably never been number one on the call sheet before, right. who enjoy that quite a lot and they like you to treat them like they're number one on the call sheet. Nice. Uh, often I find some of the most creative, giving actors and people in this business are the most talented ones. Right. Um, often sometimes that's not the case. But, you know, there's a room for forgiveness because there's a lot of people who are, um, I, can, I, can, I, I never used to get pretense, but I get the reason why some people have to have a, a degree of yeah. distance between you and them because right. familiarity can open a communication door that they want to try and remain ajar, but not fully open. Just purely because there's a lot of pressure to, they're spending thirty to fifty thousand dollars on a take, mm. and if someone's head somewhere else talking about something else, they're not in their job. Yeah. So I get that now, having worked at that level um, several times. I get it. Uh, last question. Mm -hmm. Who is someone who you've never worked with that you'd really love to? <clears throat> Martin Scorsese. Does it pick? <laughs> Everyone would love to work with Scorsese. Yeah, yeah. Spielberg. Yeah. Um, I'd love to work with Joaquin Phoenix, mm -hmm. Edward Norton, Gary Oldman, Tom Hardy. Um, Michael Mann, Pacino De Niro, <laughs> Jack Nicholson. <laughs> but that's not going to happen. Oh, he He's retired now, now, isn't he? Yeah. He's yeah. retired. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty good. It's pretty that's good. just the male actors. There's of female actresses as well that I love to work with. Nicole Kidman, I, I love, I love her work as well. Um, Rooney Mara and Charlie Theron. Yeah. Great actress. Plenty. Of good ones there. Brian, thank you so much for joining us and for, for uh, me. bringing your films to the festival. Here's to Romford 2022. Cheers.